Hi, and welcome to uh, UBC Public Humanities Hub Public Scholarship Speaker Series on Art and Testimony, co-hosted by the University of Victoria's Survivor-Centered Visual Narratives. I'm Biz Nidham, a cluster lead with the project and director of the UBC Comic Studies Cluster, as well as faculty member in the Department of Central, Eastern, and Northern European Studies in the Faculty of Arts at UBC. With my colleagues, Dr. Ferranik Sina and Dr. Francisca Luaji, we welcome you to today's discussion. We want to begin by acknowledging that UBC is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people, land on which we are, in fact, uninvited guests. We are grateful to be able to do this work here, and because today's panel is virtual, we invite attendees to acknowledge the territories from which they're joining us today. In today's webinar, Veronica Sina and Francisca Luaji join me in talking about why comics. So thank you both for joining me today, and thank you to all the participants who have joined us from near and far um, to discuss and learn about exactly that question, why comics. I think that's actually where we're gonna begin. Um, because this uh, webinar is featured as part of the Public Humanities Hub and the project that many of us are invested in, um, the the question why comics has two, two points of, of connection to the work that we're doing more generally and the project itself. And it's one of these questions that we get a lot when we're talking about the role of comics and graphic art in um, storytelling and bearing witness and testimony to genocide and human rights atrocities. So we're gonna start with why comics? And I'm gonna get at this in two different ways. And I'm first gonna begin with why not graphic novels? So I'd like to invite you both to speak to um, the language of both this panel and of comic studies, where so many people insist that graphic novels are is the language you should use when we're talking about earnestly engaging with, with this kind of visual material. But us comic scholars insist on referring to it as comic. So I'm going to invite you both to speak to that. Uh, maybe Veronique, if you would like to begin, um, and then I'll invite you, Francisca, to join. Thank you very much, Biz, and hello, everybody. Yeah, um, I'm personally not a big fan of the term graphic novel. Um, I try to avoid it. I try to teach my students to avoid it <laughs> because um, I think it suggests that uh, we need uh, a, t a form of surrogate term for comics and that comics is not good enough, um, that comics need a form of legitimization or uplifting and upgrade uh, by finding alternative terms like graphic novel, graphic narrative, autographics, whatever. There are a lot of terms that popped up the last uh, years. And as a um, comic scholar, I would suggest that we um, stop doing that. <laughs> Start uh, to talk about comics. It's an umbrella term. It has its flaws. It's not a perfect term. But um, it's a term that does not suggest that um, the medium, the art form, is not good enough. Um, so perhaps this is first statement. I don't know if Francisca agrees. I think she agrees. <laughs> yes, certainly. No, I think you've captured that very well. It's it's definitely a discussion about what what gives the medium a certain cultural legitimacy. Um, and the word comics is obviously, you know, has its connotations and and and. Uh, brings up notions of not being not serious and then, and then that triggers the question of why comics especially in, in contexts like the holocaust and, and other genocides and other serious topics um, and the medium has in part moved beyond those discussions but they keep coming up that they're, they're, they're never going to go really away I think and um, I teach in the French department and we have similar similar um, issues around the term bande dessinée which um also refers to an origin that was perhaps more humble in, in, in newspapers, and then it's abbreviated to BD, which sounds a little bit um, you know, linked linked to children again. So the medium, the medium has that history. And I I'm I'm not sure if 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 I I, I reject the search the term. Maybe that's you know, maybe a slight difference with with, with what Veronique was saying, though I fully understand um her point. I, I, I can see where the term comes from. And, and for me, it's part of its history of emancipation that it's aiming for. And it's one of the strengths that it takes. And 
um, the, the notion of graphic novel was, was maybe um, an attempt to lean into literature a bit more with the term novel and, and gain some, some legitimacy from that side. We also see different um, tendencies, I think, today in the way that graphic novels try um, to, to be more legitimate. And for instance, they lean into, into the art scene with exhibitions, with museums. So it's another way of, of saying it's the artwork that counts. So it's a hybrid medium and it leans into different different strategies, I think, to 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 assert itself. And in French and you know in, in other languages, we also have this this notion of the of the ninth art, the neuvième art. So it's it's that claim that the medium is trying trying to make um, to 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 be considered as a full fledged art, and and yeah, it's an issue. It's 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 kind of trying to break away from from its origins in that way. But I I fully follow Veronique in saying that maybe we need to reclaim these and assert the power of 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 what the medium stands for and what it can be today. Because it's a medium, it's not literature in itself. It, it has pictures and text, so it's not the same as literature. It's not just a subgenre of literature. And exactly. this is why I have a problem with this whole, and, and as, as a, a scholar working in Germany, we don't have an alternative term. So it's comics, or and then it's graphische Literatur, and it's literature, no? it's graphic literature, and it's not just literature. Um, and this is something as a media scholar <laughs> that's really getting on my nerves <laughs> because we we should be um, um, we we should know better now by now because uh, twenty years ago ago okay I understand that we have to make this point but now we can just when I, when I started to or when I finished to write my uh, PhD thesis I think it was in two thousand fourteen and I um, started my uh, to write my uh, to finish my introduction chapter and I did this overview like you have to I thought I have to do it and to legitimize why I'm working on comics and my PhD advisor told me don't do that why do you do that you don't have to do it be part of the next generation who does not do that just do it just work with comics and about comics don't try to explain why you don't have to and this is that that sticks with me until today and I try to to explain this to my students. Yeah, for me, in addition to many of these considerations that you brought up, um, graphic novel is so tied to the marketing campaigns around comics that it's a, a form of resistance to like firmly ground the work that I do in comics to resist the way in which these comics are characterized as graphic novels in order to sell them to certain publics. So it's a little bit of advocacy, uh, a little bit of anti-capitalist work, I think, to embrace the term comics among all of these other issues. Uh, one of the really interesting tensions that I even hear when you were both talking about comics is, is how we also refer to comics as a form, as a medium, um, and that's maybe not a conversation for this particular moment because I'd like to move on. But it's such, such a, uh, a problem of the field that we don't quite understand exactly the, the, the role, the formal characteristics of comics play. And we do. And we have so many ways to refer to it as because medium doesn't. It, it, I, I use medium all of the time. We, I've also used form um, to describe how we define what comics are. And I think this is a really interesting tension that we have in our field. Um, but I'd like to move on to continue on the note of why comics. Uh, and Veronique, you started talking uh, a little bit about your dissertation work. And so this next why comics I want to make um, personal and how it connects to your particular research. Uh, why comics for you? Uh, how did you both come to research comics, to embrace comics as an important medium or form um, in the work that you do? And uh, how does it connect to that research and the research questions that that you that you began asking earlier in your career? And then we're going to turn to how that connects to this particular project. So, uh, Francisca, would you like to begin? Because Veronica began last time. Um, yes, if you like, it's. Um, I think maybe Veronica, from what she was saying, has been a kind of comic scholar from the start of her career, and maybe she'll correct me in a moment um, when when we come to her. I can to comics in a more indirect manner, I would say. Where I was trained in Belgium and had a fairly traditional um, literature and linguistics training um, in, in, in Romans languages. Um, and though there was already research around comics and graphic novels and, and all kind of mediums happening, but it was not not a kind of, you know, 
uh, full component, I would say, of my studies at that time or of my PhD research. So I actually came to comics through my research in Holocaust studies when I was um, working, especially then on the second generation. And, and that medium took on, you know, took on a new importance in that context. So that's one part, the kind of research part that led me to comments more after my PhD, I would say. The other part is maybe more an element of, of chance and context also that I, I moved to the UK um, and in a department where I was a Belgian scholar, I became the kind of person who took on the comics um, scene or medium as, as, a, as a tool for students because obviously I was, despite not having, you know, formally studied it as part of my degree, I was obviously, I had grown up with with the medium and and then you know had a research interest in it and, and that kind of expand so it was a combination i would say of research and contextual factors that then gradually kind of broadened my my focus on on the field um my personal starting point uh, to work with comics was uh, art spielman's mouse because we read mouse uh, during my bachelor studies in american studies uh, i took a course in uh, jewish american culture and literature and um this was the first time as a student that i got uh, involved in comic studies and uh, then it was for my master thesis because i was looking for a topic and i wanted to write something uh, on disney and the princess movies in gender <laughs> but then uh, my supervisor told me no you already did something about this why don't you write about sin city the movie it just came out at that time and I saw it in uh, the cinema and I was really flashed and I thought, oh yeah, that's that's something and it has a specific aesthetic that is new. And at that time it was new that uh, comic books came to life on screen and were visible there. And so I wrote my master thesis on the representation of gender in Sin City. And uh, then I uh, decided to do my PhD and to take this as a basis. And I wrote my PhD on the remediation of gender in comic book movies. Um, and since then, <laughs> since then I'm working in the field. And at that time, there was not so much comic studies happening in Germany. Um, I studied at the Ruhr University in Bochum. And so I had to build my own networks and my own structures. And um, this um, helped me to, um, um, to help comic studies to get more institutionalized in Germany. Uh, we're still not there, but there's a lot happening and a lot happened the last 10, 15 years. Um, and then every time I teach, I try to teach something uh, or either it's a seminar that has a focus on comics or I just involve comics as a medium like other media. Um, and to to get my students to to know the medium as one medium like film and television and digital media and um, this works quite well also and I have different uh, my perspective this could be interesting is as a media scholar that focuses who that uh, focus on um, the aspect of media aesthetics and I come from a gender studies perspective but I'm also um, working on the topic of Holocaust comics and there on the question of representation and aesthetic as well. Thank you for sharing your journeys. Um, it's interesting how both of yours touch upon my own, what brought me to comic studies. Uh, and Veronique, uh, which I find what I find particularly fascinating about um, your, your account is that uh, your engagement with comics began with Mouse and your research has circled back to exactly that, that subject, the question of what it is to represent uh, the Holocaust, uh, engaging with some of the censorship around Mouse that has come out recently and whatnot, and bringing these questions about representation into um, other other texts that are in engaging with the history of the Holocaust and genocide. Uh, which brings me to your connection to this project. Uh, both of you are affiliated with the work that we're doing uh, in different ways, through different clusters, through different themes, different complex histories of trauma and human rights atrocities. And so, Veronique, maybe I'll invite you to speak first about the work you're doing with and around the project. And then, Francesca, you can share some of your uh, the work that you're doing within the Rwandan cluster. Yes, um, I have to admit that I'm not part of uh, one of the clusters. I'm an affiliated scholar that worked for the last two years 
um, again and again with Barbara Yelin, who is an artist uh, who is associated with um, and part of one of the clusters. And um, um, so I, my, my last essay is on But I Live. Uh, and the question of representation and what comics can do when it comes to the representation of Holocaust. Um, so this uh, is my connection to the project um, and that it touches upon questions that I'm dealing with or I dealt with the last few years uh, in my own research. Um, and uh, together with um, not only Barbara Yelin, but also with Barbara Yelin, uh, we started a project, an online project, comics project, um, that is um, called How Are You? Uh, Illustrators Against Antisemitism, Hatred and Racism. And Barbara contributed uh, a short comic on Amy Abel, um, with whom she already worked with and just published um, the um, her, her life story in comics form. Um, so uh, these are some connection, connecting points, uh, but I think Francisca has a lot more <laughs> to tell about her connection to the program, to the whole project. Well, I'm sure, um, you know, um, I started also like um, Veronique and being affiliated with, with the initial project. Um, so there was a two year um, grant that focused on, on stories of the Holocaust of which But I Live is, is the, the, the the fantastic outcome um and so the institution where I, where I was based at the University of Leicester was affiliated with that project so we were lucky enough to host the launch of the of that first project and we had Barbara there and also Miriam um, who may be who may be here today and so it was a great opportunity to meet um to meet the artists and 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 the team and that was just the week before the pandemic everything kind of closed down um very shortly after that and I think that the pandemic has been an opportunity in some ways for such an international project in the sense that we connected a lot on, online. So we held some artist cafes um, where, where we heard, you know, um, about drafts from the artists and had some conversations with them. So it's been nice to follow um, how how um, how the narratives took took shape from from storyboards and conversations with um, with the survivors to to the kind of final project, which obviously has been extremely well received. And so I'm, I'm part, as, as you said, um, a piece of the of the second project, which is a seven year project that looks at, at several um, genocides and mass atrocities. And I'm more specifically affiliated with um, the Rwandan cluster um, together with Erin GC from the University of Glasgow. And I, I know that one of our Rwandan researchers is also uh, in the audience today. And so that's, I think, an, an, an interesting um, expansion also to see how the medium you know, will travel to different cultural contexts. We've already talked a little bit about cultural differences in, in approach and terminology, um, but obviously there are many other questions um, that that will arise as we as we as we work across those different different cultural fields. And we have to you know ask questions about who our audiences are, who our survivors are, what what how the medium can kind of embrace uh, those different different cultural um, contexts. So that's that's a work in progress, but I think it's a really a really interesting one. Thank you. Um, I I want to talk more concretely about the project a little bit in the minute and 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 the collaborative work of the project. But some of the things that you both just said make me want to turn our attention immediately to the role of the medium um, in representing these complex histories. And um, Veronique, you, you, you said that your research poses the question time and time again, what comics can do with regards to the representation of the Holocaust. And so I want to invite you both to consider that within the, the various cultural, historical political context that you're working about what comics brings to uh, the representation of trauma, the representation of memory, um, the way in which uh, comics engagement is fundamentally political and, and the role of politics in this representation. Uh, so uh, what do comics bring to discourses of history and the discourses of history that you work with in particular? Who did we begin with last time? Who wants to start? <laughs> I think Francisca, it's your turn. I was going to say, go ahead. Um, I think we can really look at that question from different different perspectives, and it depends a little bit whether we're talking about representation, whether we're talking about representation of individual memory, questions of collective memory. So 
um, there's different strands to it. And then obviously what 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 is always not political or what is traumatic depends a little bit on on that. And um, I'm sure Veronique will um will have plenty of, of to say on that as well. For instance, if if we're talking about the first project and Barbara Yelin's work, we know that where there were gaps in memory, there was a way of representing those gaps in in the comic. Um and and um because of because it's sequential art, it's possible to fill, you know, to filter out or to target on specific to target specific images and, and work around individual memory questions. There's obviously beyond that also the broader collective memory question. We have almost stock images is perhaps not the word, but we have certain representations of, of the Holocaust. We have pictures that we have all seen or that many of us have seen. Um, and, and these are, are a visual archive on which um on which comics can draw as well and can can maybe represent or integrate or question and mediate um for viewers today. So comics can 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 engage with that. I think I'd I'd like maybe to say something specifically about, about post memory, but maybe I'll I'll let Veronique speak to this point first and then we can we can follow up. I think um I totally agree with everything Francisca said, um, that we have to consider and keep in mind that medium, that comics is a medium and has a specific mediality, so a specific toolbox, if you want, um, that we, we already named the uh, a blending of, uh, we have the, the picture, we have the text, we have the sequence, we have the single panel, um, and another thing that makes comics comics, it's, it's a graphic medium, it's handcrafted, and this leads to a um, certain amount of self-reflexivity that um, is always, the, the handmadeness, the handcraftedness is always reflected upon. Um, and uh, there are different drawing styles, of course, but you will never have the same photorealistic um, image in a comic as you have with photography, for example. So comics are not, um, is not a medium that has a, um, a, the form of indexicality that photography has. And this is something that is very important if we talk about things like representation, if we talk about things like how can the Shoah, the Holocaust be represented, be shown in medium, in any medium, and what can comics do maybe differently? Because for a long time, and still pops up every time there's a Holocaust comic, can we do this? Are we allowed to do this? Is it adequate? And I think we should not ask the question if we can do it, but how can we do it? And um, comics, um, the meaning of comics um, gives certain possibilities. Um, and it also has its flaws and its limits when it comes to the Shoah, but it has a lot of potential also. Yeah, I, I very much agree. And I appreciate how you both got at some of these issues. I also really value the way that comics are self-referential, draw attention to their own construction, um, and, and that story itself is always a form of construction. Um, and that history is just a story <laughs> that we tell, a popular story. And, and on that note, um, Veronique, from some of the reading I've done of, of your scholarship, uh, you mentioned uh, the way that comics and photography function differently in representing uh, complex histories. You've also referred to comics as counter-documentary in a really interesting way. And I wanted to know if you wanted to speak a little bit about um, the way in which uh, comics presents history differently and uh, can be set against other forms of historiography, uh, other ways of imagining the past, in pot potentially in those terms. And so you draw from shoot, you draw, you, you talk about counter documentary. So I invite you to speak a little bit about that. And then I'd love to talk more about post memory, Francisca. Yes, um, comics as a form of counter documentary that is not classic documentary form in the sense of uh, indexicality that we need um, film or photography as the only medium that has the full claim to show the truth. Um, and comics as a graphic medium that is drawn that always draws attention to the drawn lines um, and to the hand of the artist. 
um, does something differently um, and can has also the potential to incorporate other media. So we find, for example, often photographies in uh, Holocaust comics as a kind of gesture of authenticity, as a claim of authenticity, but at the same time pointing at the fact that a photography, there is no such thing as uh, an unmediated image of memory or the Holocaust or things in the past because everything is mediated in some way. And um, photography might um, give the illusion that it's not like that, but um, the graphic medium comic uh, always draws attention to itself as a medium, as something that mediates, or is even when we are talking about post remediated, and um, that our memories are remediated and are based on images and media and things we have already seen. Um, and I think this is very, very important. Um, and that we um, have uh, with comics a medium that constantly has the ability and potential to reflect upon this. It can, it does it more or less, but it can do it. Thank you, Francisca. I feel like the oh. conversation on post memory does tie into elements. Yes, of this. yes, exactly. I think yeah. I think it uh, links very well to what Veronique was saying. I, I, you know, and going back also to your question, is that the question always comes: Can we do this? And I think the question itself kind of often stems from a misconception of the medium. One of the earlier conceptions that we were talking about as comics as a medium of pure entertainment, um, you know, which which is part of what it can be. Um, but that you know, it comes from a simplistic definition that thinks maybe of a narrow vision of what comics can offer, and that doesn't incorporate necessarily that reflexivity that that Veronique was was referring to. It's it's seen maybe as a children's medium, and you know, we've mentioned Disney already, but um, that that's the kind of connotations that people that people bring to it, and then they don't see how it can be compatible maybe with a topic like the Holocaust. Though obviously we have a long history now of outstanding comics that show that there is you know more than potential um but that the medium effectively um has all these criteria that Veronique was was mentioning that make it particularly suited um to to deal with questions of mediation and and with reflexivity and that's also where i wanted to um link to the notion of post memory because i think both Veronique and i maybe came you know two mouse and two second generation literature to the to that question of memory in in comics and um but the notion of post memory, which you know I'm, I'm many people know, but just just to specify, is a notion that was coined by by Marianne Hirsch for those that came after and did not have a personal memory of the events. And in, in, in the case of the Holocaust, is is the context in which she coined that term. But it's since been used in in different um, contexts and who are still impacted by that and maybe also had these images, you know, coming to them and had photography and maybe photographies of lost ones and and it was trying to give trying to give a place to that personal connection that was not one of direct memory but a kind of after memory in a way and i think that um for all the reasons that veronica and yourself were mentioning um comics can help shape that question of what does it mean for me exactly because it's not as a, not a totalizing narrative it comes as a sequence, it comes as maybe fragmented takes or multiple takes on the question, and it can draw together multiple perspectives for a question that perhaps we don't fully master. And, you know, there have been a lot of debates around Holocaust representation, one of them being the one that Veronique mentioned about this illusion of transparent access and direct access to the past, which, which has been um, considered problematic. Also, the idea that we might somehow know what it was or be, be able to to grasp it in its entirety is also problematic. And I, I can, you know, and each time we try, we try certain things. If you look at how debates about monuments have evolved, they have also shifted enormously from, from quite graphic to, to, to more abstract, to more individualized. So we are always looking for ways in which to meaningfully engage with the Holocaust. And I think part of that makes, makes the engagement meaningful. There's not like one way that once and forever would, would suit. Um, and, and it's a bit like a Sisyphus thing. Each time we kind of develop a part and then we think maybe it's not perfect. 
and we start again, we take a new approach, but that memory is a verb in a way. So that's also how you how how you keep it alive, I think. Um, and and that keeps that keeps people engaged with what what was it? What can it mean for us today? Um, and I think for the general, you know, for the point where we are at, I think comics offer a very meaningful tool and part to explore what what experiences have been, maybe experiences that that um that are out of reach, maybe for today's readers. But how can they go to them? And one thing that perhaps we haven't mentioned so much in in our discussion of the current project is the conversation between artists and survivors, which is very central to it. Um, and so the artists engage with a survivor, reflect on that engagement, represent the survivor story, also often represent themselves. And I think for today's reader, that's quite a powerful way of engaging because the artist will have questions that they have and, and struggle with representation questions that the audience maybe has. So it's it's a way of, of engaging an audience and, and, you know, part of the discussions are always about the survivors are disappearing. So what do we do? Um, but there is a there is there is a broader question I think about building meaningful connections and and um, going beyond maybe the parts that have been tried in the past and making the most of the strength the strengths of the comics as a medium I would say. Um, I really like how you characterize the power of uh, the power of comics in these contexts as as not just there's not just one way that comics do justice or serve the work of testimony and witnessing in the context of human rights atrocities and genocide. And then you immediately brought up exactly one of those ways that I wanted us to probe a little bit more uh, deeply, the collaborative aspect of this project. And so for those of, of those members of our audience that aren't familiar with the methodologies behind uh, this project, uh, we pair graphic novelists with survivors to co-create um, a comic, a graphic novel, graphic literature. <laughs> Uh, around a, a certain experience, uh, um, what it meant to survive and live through these um, really complex and traumatic pasts. And uh, so this is one way that comics is, is, is getting at the difficulty to represent these histories and offer opportunities for survivors to tell the story of their experience uh, in the face of many of, of, of us losing so many of these survivors as time marches on. So I wanted you both to talk a little bit about the way in which comics uh, um, offers opportunities for this kind of collaboration, um, for the work of public scholarship, uh, the role that comics can play, not just in how it represents the past, but in the in the process of representing that past. And uh, perhaps you might want to specifically talk about um, Francisco, your experience in this collaborative work and some of the insights that you've garnered in uh, witnessing it, because one part is a cluster lead. It's a, you, you're a witness to the collaboration and a facilitator, but it's really a relationship that's developing between the graphic novelist or the cartoonist, the comics practitioner, and the survivor that they are paired with. So, um, Francisco, maybe you can talk a little bit from personal experience, but maybe Veronique, you want to talk a little bit about, especially. Um, since you are have so intimately worked with uh, Barbara Yellen um, about the process and and um, what comics bring, uh, what kind of opportunities comics bring to this collaborative work. We're going to start with Verani. Please, I'll invite you to speak first. Mm, I think as you introduced it, it's more a question for Francisca, as I did not, I was not part of the collaborative process in the project. But um, perhaps to uh, go a step back first, when we have a look at the uh, medium of comics and the comic scholarship, um, we also need collaborative work there because we are dealing with a hybrid form. Um, and so um, I think we really need uh, uh, interdisciplinary work coming from different disciplines, different perspectives, different backgrounds, um, because um, there are no, I know nobody who studied comics. We all came from another background, media studies, literature, art history. Um, so there's a form of collaborative work that we need as scholars. That's more my perspective at the moment. But of course, 
it's very interesting to have an exchange with um, the, the uh, scientific part and the artistic part and to see how comics are being made. And this is something that scholars, um, I learn a lot from that. I learned, a st I keep learning and I'm fascinated by it. And there is a, a collaboration is essential to understand how comics work. Perhaps this is something that I could add to the discussion. Definitely. And I really, um, as a scholar who came to comics as a field from art history and German studies, that really resonates with me. Um, the multiple perspectives, um, the the way that we have to collaborate within the field itself to understand the work of comics that we draw from so many different uh, disciplines in order to theorize the work of comics. So I think that is that is definitely part of the collaborative, collaborative nature of, of comic studies. So thank you for that. Francisca? Yes, no, that's absolutely true. And and it's, yeah, again, one of the strengths of the medium, I think, that it draws together scholars from and insights from so many disciplines. And it also sheds lights on so many things, you know, the questions we've been discussing around how does it circulate, how is it perceived, say a lot from a sociological point of view in themselves. They also, you know, shed light on, on how we perceive history, how we construct memory. So they 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 give an insight into into various that they you know we we come from this different disciplines to study them and can again study different disciplines through them. So that's a strong um a strong point. Going back also to the other dimension of collaborative, I think in a way, especially this project is is set up as as a kind of a participatory project maybe in some in some ways. So we be of you know we work with with community partners we work with survivors who sometimes are part of groups or communities as well so uh, maybe slightly different and that may be a little bit different I think from from cluster to cluster and you can maybe comment on that as well from your own um, cluster biz um, at, in in the context of the Holocaust maybe of course there was the context of two brothers but they might be among the you know the later survivors or the, the the more isolated survivors in other contexts we are talking about whole communities who are still trying to live with the aftermath of 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 what happens so it's it's a different notion of of um of bringing a story and i think as as researchers we always have ethical questions about what stories do we bring and and um from that point of view i think that that teamwork is is again a strength in 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 having having conversations and 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 um making sure that what that what we do is not necessarily an individual choice but but that we kind of consider all, all these different implications of 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 the representation so the the story about collaboration covers covers a lot of ground in 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 that sense because there there comes a sort of responsibility with with the project um as well as well as the, as the questions of representation beyond that i think that um comics for the reasons that we have mentioned that sometimes make that people have reservations about them are still perceived as an accessible medium um and, and can again make the most from that and reclaim that in, in some ways um the project also has an educational dimension and comics have traditionally also been linked with children's literature and that has been something that has maybe weighed on it as a you know, or weighted down as a heritage. But again, we can turn it around and say um it can be and and it's not either or we don't need to um try try and you know try and, and negate part of what comics can do. And it's it's interesting that it can be a a, a tool for conversation and a tool to 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 bring you know bring subjects up and then and then explore them from there. So that's that's Again, a way I think in which you can collaborate with audiences, with community partners, with museums, um, and and it's a kind of afterlife of the project that as as uh, you know, but I live is showing is is very very strong and powerful, and and um, that shows the potential of of the medium in in a different respect. I think one of you know the one of the questions that I just mentioned briefly earlier, and which I think will will be interesting. To, to follow up on as, as we as this project evolves is the cultural diversity amongst the different contexts and how how the medium will ad adapt to that and have you know have maybe at times an almost ethnographic component as well but but how will that you know how will that feed into 
the the broader project and and um how 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 will we foreground the different cultural voices um on their own terms i think is it's is, is, is a very you know you know for me will be one of the the main the main realizations of this project yeah and there's two points that you uh, one of the points that you made was how uh comics spark conversations and then you get at that in different ways uh you you mentioned it's a, a comics association with uh younger audiences which while problematic for the field in some ways also means that these comics are reaching different audiences uh which i think is a really powerful part of the way that it's sparking conversation um it can be utilized in the classroom differently it can be utilized uh in different levels of education uh different different groups or categories of readers get different things out of the reading experience because you can pair it with theoretical texts or you can just sit with the story which itself is very powerful but also the methodologies behind the project that it's collaborative it's very much uh, between a survivor and an artist it's very much grounded in the conversation that occurs between those two individuals and so you're talking about the ethics of representation and uh, one of our previous uh, web webinars that we've had as part of the series was on participatory action Action research and the way that this collaboration between artist and survivor ensures that the story is guided by that relationship and not dictated by a researcher um, who is outside of the community, um, isn't themselves a survivor. Uh, and so I think that this, this methodology behind the project, the collaborative work between survivor and 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 a graphic novelist, also helps us get at the ethical. Uh, problems of representing mass atrocities. Uh, so thank you for that. And so before we uh, turn our attention to the questions we have from the audience, I promise you I have more questions, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> um, we, I invited you both to share some pages so that uh, we could talk through the images because we've talked about the images, but the work of visual analysis of concretely engaging with the page um, to understand the work of comics is not always uh, legible to individuals outside of comic studies. And each of us from our various disciplines approach the work of visual analysis differently as well. So uh, I wanted to invite you both to share some pages so that we could talk about what we see as comic scholars uh, working in these, these uh, with these different histories and different themes. So I'm going to start by sharing the PowerPoint that I have in the first two Two slides are from you, Veronique. So, and they come from uh, But I Live. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen now and then uh, invite you to just ruminate on the images that you shared with us and what, what they mean in the context of your research uh, and how, how they answer the question, why comics and these themes? Yes, thank you very much. Could you show the second slide? I'm sorry, I just decided to start with the second one. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I um, decided to show three different pages um, as examples from the three different stories um, that we find in But I Live in the comics anthology. Um, so we have three different pages from three different artists um, showing three different perspectives and three different stories. And this is um, a very um, important, interesting point that we have the perspective from three different survivors from, from three different uh, witnesses. And um, I think this is one of um, the, when we come to the to the artistic style that we have three different styles involved. So the three different stories that we find in Bada Live have different looks. And this is very important because it reflects upon the question that we had about um, talking about the, um, how can the Holocaust be represented? Um, so, that um, by using different styles, uh, by representing different styles in one comic anthology, we reflect upon that there is no one story that can tell the complete story of the Holocaust. It's not possible. So there's a sense of incompleteness that lies into the Holocaust as um, such a deep impact. Um, it has such a deep impact that we cannot show it in one story and we should not try 
So this already reflects upon this whole discussion and debate. I think this is very important. And um, we also see that different artistic styles connote different things or can connote different things. So we have um, a style, uh, and I think uh, Miriam is in the audience, which is great, um, uh, from coming from one a page from Miriam Libicki and um, a kind of resistance uh, based on the account and memories of David Schaffer. And we see that uh, Miriam uses uh, a style that kind of um, reminds us of uh, children's book and fairy tales. And this is fascinating, I think, with a topic like the Holocaust, because we, um, it has this kind of self-reflexive moment in it that we already had talking about that there's this history the medium of comics connected to youth culture. And this is on the one hand reflected upon, I would say, but also that we have the perspective, the memories of somebody who survived um, the Holocaust while being a child. So in the first panel that we see, we see the reflection of the protagonist who sees himself in the mirror, but he sees himself as a child. And there we have some of the potential we already touched on um, when it comes to comics that past and present are juxtaposed or can be juxtaposed on the comic page in one single panel. Um, because the past is always present when it comes to traumatic memories, uh, especially when it comes to the Holocaust. So this is something that I, th I think is fascinating. And then we have in the middle a page uh, drawn by uh, Gilad Zelikta, and there the style is totally different. It's more minimalistic, it's more reduced, um, and it works in a different way, but it also works and shows the whole range and uh, capabilities of the medium. And um, what I think is very interesting is that we have, um, with Gilad uh, Selectas, uh, we have a style, we don't have any frames. There's the white page. So the frame is the comic page. So there is an openness to the drawings that are shown and uh, something that also alludes to the incompleteness of the uh, process of um, represent, representing the Holocaust because you cannot, it should never be completed and the remembrance should never be completed. And this is something reflected in the style. And then we have Barbara Yelin's style working with watercolors, which looks more like a painting and can be very detailed and at the same time very reduced and without details and losing details. So we have in the panel in the first row and the um, panel on uh, the right side where Amy Abel has no mouth because she's kind of speechless um, in her traumatic uh, memories. And I think these are just some examples of how um, comics can work and how there's this toolbox <laughs> uh, that can be used by artists in order to reflect upon uh, specific topics when it comes to trauma, memory and the Holocaust. Uh, it's so profound witnessing you go through these pages because it brings up some of these topics that we that we didn't address in this conversation because um, it requires us to sit with the images. And so the conflation of past and present, and I loved how you characterize the role of the present or the past always being present in the present. And then how you look at the, the grid format, the layout of the page is also uh, part of the meaning making of the narrative itself, that we have the images, but we also have how the composition functions to guide our understanding of the story, and that we can't look at the images without understanding how the layout is changing, how we under, how how we engage with it. And so the process of juxtaposition of past and present, the way the panel frames are crafted, either um, mechanically or digitally or drawing attention even more to the role of the artist and the artist's hand in constructing this image. And that how we have these visual metaphors that get at survivor experience, um, an inability to speak, an inability to remember that we can only get at through visual, visual means. We can't articulate an inability to speak in the same way. Um, comics capture silence in a way literature I don't think ever could, um, or anxiety, um, because it creates a response in the viewer um, that feels feels many of these uh, elements of that experience in a different way. So thank you so much, Veronica, for sharing these pages with us. Um, 
uh, Francisca, shall we turn to your pages? I don't know which one you want to begin with. I know that these are coming from the artists that the one of the two artists that's collaborating in your cluster. Um, sure. Yeah. Tony, do you want to go back to your first slide first, or not necessarily? And I can do it later, so we can it's, yeah, mingle. It's up to yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> up to yourselves. Yeah. Um, so we, we return have, to it during uh, questions, even just so we have time to hear from our audience. Yes, we already have two questions and we haven't even hit the Q&A. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so if you like, you can scroll through. Yes, this is just the title page of the comic uh, by Michel Kishka, Deuxième Génération, Je venais pas de mon père. So what I didn't tell my father, second generation, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the main title. So um, Michel Kishka, who is, as this was saying, one of the artists who will be working with us on the Rwandan cluster, has himself um a, a story as as a second generation survivor of the holocaust and this this book that he published about 10 years ago deals with the, his relationship with his father so if you want to um go down maybe to the next slide is i i will just show or like like veronique has done some some of the you know elements of the toolbox um of of graphic novels and um we don't need to talk in detail about all images, but it was just to be able to pick up on, on some of these uh, techniques. So for, for Kishka as a boy, it was very hard to imagine what his father had gone through. It was not really mentioned. It was a, a, a it was present, you know, going back to that question of post memory, but it wasn't shared. And so it raised more questions than, than answers in some ways. And so here in the first panel, and I've selected I, um, isolated panels rather than, than pages as Veronique has done because, um, uh, Kishka's style is quite quite cartoon-like in a way. He also works as a political cartoonist, so also condenses a lot of um, information in a single image, though it's of course also possible to look at the whole page. Um, but so in the first in the first image here, he's just been pulled off between him because he burped at the table and his father is allowed to do that. And his mom says, yeah, but that's different because daddy has been in the camps. And then you see him think, but what are the camps? You know, so you have the speech bubbles. So it's it, the, the speech bubbles are just one, one of the most basic tools, but they can already be used to a lot of strength. Um, for instance, here on the right, you see the family picture and the dad and, and the mom are, are having this conversation in, 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 in Yiddish with the Hebrew transcript. And the, the kids are all supposed to smile because the family is this kind of revenge on Hitler in the father's mind. Um, but they're all quite uncomfortable and wondering at the, what they are saying and will they have to smile for much longer. So it's 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 already just layering and showing the tensions that existed within that childhood through very simple means of, of you know, recasting pictures of the time and thinking, oh, they were quite constructed pictures and we had to respond to a certain image of a family. And then that's deconstructed through the speech bubbles, through the, the thought bubbles that are being in there and that already show those kinds of tensions that the comic medium can portray and kind of leave for the reader to to discover so that that's an example and there are some more on the next slides if you want to have a look but it's it's entirely up to you um so the next pages i just selected them as whole pages you see the little square there uh, again with the thought bubbles that i already showed you but this these are some pages where um kishka looks at images from from the Holocaust, historical images, but you see here, and as, as Veronique already mentioned in the discussion, they are redrawn, they are hand-drawn, they are uh, mediated and kind of seen anew, and some of them we will be familiar with. You may spot on the on the right-hand side in the middle a very uh, well-known um, picture of the, of, the, of, the, of the little boy in, in the Warsaw Uprising. So it's that kind of familiar image that is revisited um, and, and question the new about what does it mean and he is looking for maybe his father in the picture no it's not him it's not him um it's and, and afraid to recognize him afraid not to recognize him if he were there maybe looking for his grandparents so it's 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 images that we are familiar with but that, that are questioned again through a personal connection and then we as a reader also look at them anew and they're not they're not the same as as being just just the yeah, just the, the historical images and the archival images that we see, they are mediated for us and, and we engage with them differently. So that's, that's again, a way of, of creating that reflection that we were discussing earlier. I think we were going to go to the discussion soon, but if you want to go to an, another slide, it's up to you entirely, Biz, you choose. Um, let's see what, how we're doing on time. Uh, we are approaching 10 a.m. 
my time, not your time. You're in a very much later hour. So maybe we should turn our attention to uh, the Q&A so that we have some time to go through those questions. But one of the things that I really appreciated you drawing attention to, and specifically when looking at these pictures, pictures is how the archive functions in the writing of history and in the rewriting or reimagining of history um, when it comes to comics. And so the way that you characterize this is like seeing anew through the cartoonist's hand, I think is really profound and something that uh, comics bring to these discourses, the incorporation of archival material, but then changing how we engage with that archival material through the drawn image instead, which I think is a very profound commentary on photography, uh, one that maybe is should be the foundation of a uh, another webinar series. Um, like I said, I still have so many mm -hmm. questions, but in the interim, we will uh, turn our attention to, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, slideshow here, but I'm happy to open it up again if our questions speak to any of these visual motifs that you've identified. So uh, we have three questions uh, in our uh, Q&A, and we invite more as we continue this conversation on why comics, which you've done such a good job in demonstrating, answering that question over the course of this conversation. Uh, so we have um, from Jerome, comics are very important and useful to the genocide survivors, like in the case of Rwanda. Genocide against the Tutsi destroyed everything, including photos and anything which can bring back the memories for us. If the comics are made in reflection of what genocide survivors give as testimony, uh, would be helpful for us and our next generations to know exactly what happened and other good things about comics is, is that everyone can understand the story, even if he or she or they do not know how to read the text or the, the, the role of um, images in uh, passing on knowledge through generations. Uh, I think this is something we spoke about a little bit in preparing for this webinar, but uh, how um, comics such as these are coding future memory. Um, the, Jerome didn't quite have a question, but I think we can we could we could speak to that a little bit. Oh no, there is a question after that comment. My question is about style. <laughs> Sorry, Jerome. <laughs> If comics can come out in different styles, which style can be used to tell the story and be understandable to the whole world without disturbing the facts from the story tellers or survival testimonies? Um, so I invite you to speak to perhaps the way in which comics can code future generations understanding of these histories, as well as the role of style in um, in, in characterizing these stories or transmitting, remediating these stories. Uh, thank you very much, Jerome, for your for your question. Um, going back to a point that Veronique made earlier, I think, and I, you know, you're you're obviously asking this this question. Um, Jerome is part of our Rwanda team, just to clarify, um, from from a survivor um, perspective as well. And I think if we if we look at it outside of the field of comics, just think about the survivor stories. I think we wouldn't say that there's one story that captures once and for all the all the experiences that happen, but maybe rather, Jerome, if, if you agree, and obviously we can discuss discuss this further, um, that the stories complement each other and that it is important to have the the diversity of stories um and 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 to listen to 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 these different stories. And I think one of the strengths that Veronique has pointed out also in relation to But I Live is this complementarity. We have different stories. We also have different styles. Um, and, and one style does, each style does different does different things and, and, and will speak differently to the reader. And, and so I, I don't think we can answer maybe a question about whether there is a single style that will bring this forward a, a little bit to what I was saying earlier. I think it's more um, a Sisyphus um, project that we approach it and we try to approach it. And, and each approach, you know, that again, linking back to some dis discussions about Holocaust representations that, that hopefully apply in other contexts as well. Each approach is a partial approach, um, but they are valid in themselves. And I think it's through that repetition of approaches that we can that we can hope maybe maybe not do justice, but to to yes, yeah, try try and engage 
in 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 a, in a meaningful way um with with the experience and but what you say is that that it the question the style plays a huge role in how people can engage um with with the stories and 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 making making them speak um to to an audience Veronique, did you want to add to that perhaps um yeah thank you very much i totally agree um there is no one perfect style but different styles do different things and i think that um one of the great strengths of a comics is that there is the possibility either to combine different stories made from different by different artists as we have in the um but i live anthology or even to combine different styles within one comic or even one panel to uh, draw the focus on different things and to point out different things. And this is something that uh, is not possible to do the same way in other media. A film does not work like this. Uh, it works differently. You will not have um, different styles with more photorealistic, more detailed, more abstract uh, color changing to black and white that you can see it simultaneously like you could see it and can see it on one single page, for example. And this is something that comics can do. Um, and there lies um, a lot of potential. And then I think it's, um, well, you it's, it's very difficult to say this style suits more for this thing and the other way around, because then we are talking also about conventions and different looks are uh, conventionalized like black and white for holocaust because it implies black and white photography does not mean to be like that we have seen three different examples uh, from bad ali from three different artists but we saw kishka's black and white more cartoony style more reduced style that works perfectly in black and white so there is no no one answer to this question i'm afraid Thank you for that. Um, both of you said really insightful things. It, it had never occurred to me that the preoccupation with black and white in graphic novels might be linked to uh, histories of documentary photography. I think that's uh, that's really profound. Um, and then the intervention of color does something even more profound. So thank you for that. Uh, our next question comes from Pratesh. One of the speakers pointed out that trauma comics works as a collaboration of the survivor and the artist. I wonder if we could say that co the comics medium has always been a collaborative art with pencilers, inkers, colorists, letters, laters. I don't actually know. Apparently, I don't know the language of uh, comics collaborative construction and others who work together to create a single issue. Um, would either of you like to speak to that? I think that's a very um, observant observation. <laughs> Absolutely, I would totally agree. Um, this is one way how comics are being made, that there is teamwork uh, involved. And uh, depending on uh, the context uh, where and when comics are being made, of course, you have this whole um, superhero Marvel industry uh, where comics have to be produced very quickly and then it's very often uh, teamwork and where you have one uh, person doing all the lettering and the other one does only the backgrounds and I don't know what. But then there's the other way and this is very interesting that of course um, and this is also strength of the medium that um, one person could do it alone. Um, and ha can create his or her um, piece of art. It's a more democratic medium than, for example, film, where you need a whole other budget, you need a whole other technique um, and technical devices. And so there are both ways, but often it is a collaborative work, and this can be um, uh, very fruitful. Francisca, did you want to speak to that or should we move on to the next question? Um, I, I do is fine. I think Veronica has, has yeah. already explained that there are different different approaches. And just to go back maybe to something that we said earlier. So the, there was this idea of maybe a bande dessinée d'auteur. So the one, the author with the one author and the kind of creative genius maybe behind it. So there's, um as opposed to maybe the mass production that you could have on the Marvel side. And then there are many, many, you know, many intermediate um formats and again it's a question of cultural legitimacy of positioning yourself in a field and 
the author about this in EA, especially on on the front on the French side at least very often going back to your point is is in black and white for, for questions of cost and so forth so there is this idea of an alternative bond in then as well um which has become successful in its own right so you know alternative is maybe no longer the term but um it has it has its own tradition and black and white has specific connotations from that point of view as well as as, as well as color um which might you know try initially have been more associated maybe again with the children's medium so it's it's it, there are a lot of questions around indeed who who takes part and where does the medium position itself how is it received um there are those questions as well as those of style and and, and medium and and expressive power thank you francesca uh, our next question comes from magna a graduate student in the english program here working explicitly on comics so we don't have a lot of graduate students working explicitly on comics but here is one <laughs> The act of representing survivor testimonies can be ethically fraught. How do we ensure that our gaze when reading testimony as mediated through the comic form is not one of a beneficiary or a savior? So in what way can we imagine not positioning the reader in an ethically problematic situation? I think that's a really great question. Who would like to take it? Perhaps one way is to reflect upon the process of mediating a testimony from somebody else through somebody else. And this is something that we have seen uh, when, for example, um, on the uh, page that I've shown from Miriam Libicki's uh, comic and uh, Gilad Selikta and Barbara Yelin do it also in their comics, that Miriam draws herself into the comic. Um, so that um, the process of that one person creates images based on the memory of another person is shown and reflected upon. And we even see in this, the um, uh, page on the, the left one in the um, panel row uh, on top, where we can even see the camera standing there that because everything will be recorded. So this whole process of mediation is reflected upon uh, in the comic, in the whole anthology again and again. So this could be one way of showing it. And another one, of course, through the different styles that we have a stylization and aesthetics that we see that this is an artistic artifact that somebody made in order to create images that have not been there before and um, alternative images in retrospective even. So this I think um, may be important points, but I think Francisca certainly has uh, a lot of good points to add <laughs> to this well, question. I fully agree. I think it's it's maybe called, the, you know, some of the things that, that Veronique was described are maybe partly distancing mechanisms and they, they function in different ways. Um, in 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 the sense that um, as through through the reflexive dimensions that we've mentioned, maybe we don't give the reader the impression that they are there or that they um, that they that they have a full knowledge, but rather that they are trying to grapple maybe with with, with what it was. So that's a kind of distancing mechanism. Um, I, I I do see where you're getting at with with, with your question because to a certain extent. You, 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 it's maybe hinting at the fact that that if if we produce empathy, does it then produce a kind of feel good um, connotation for the reader that that thinks, oh, I'm not like that, or I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the empathy, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not in that context then. But I think a lot of a lot of the a lot of the books and for instance, going back to Barbara Yelin's earlier work about Irmina, don't don't raised that question in 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 that way if, if if you've not read it you might be very interested in it it's um about um Barbara Lynn's grandmother who who became complicit with Nazism and it shows how in very ordinary gestures you can become complicit or not not resist and I think there's also a powerful narrative there that is not um aimed at a feel good feeling for the reader but rather showing how each of us maybe can be at risk of of engaging or com of of being compliant, and it goes you know back to 
very you know big ethical questions around bystanders or implicated subjects and and so forth um but it, it raises critical questions for the reader as well that's what i wanted to say it's it you know there are always risks of course with every form of representation and engagement but it can also raise critical questions for the readers thank you and uh, we have two more questions uh one the first from shannon letty who's um my cluster co-lead. So thank you, Shannon, for your question. She wrote, I appreciate this conversation so much. Thank you. Beautiful, articulate, and inspirational. I wonder how each of you might describe the quote-unquote call to action that your work evokes and who you must hope, uh, who you most hope will hear that call. I know you have touched on this throughout your discussion, but I'm grappling with questions about audience myself, so I would love to hear your further thoughts. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I'm I'm happy happy to start, uh, Shannon, and thank you thank you for the question. I think it's something that in the Rwanda cluster we are definitely thinking about as well. Um, obviously this is, and and, and we've discussed that at, at several points also with with the team at the university. Um, I I think to a certain extent this is a Canadian funded project, and that that comes with with maybe certain expectations and around who will read it and it's um. You know who the educational materials will be for as well we have also a strong commitment and i think that was also written into the project of, of making hopefully um as much material as possible available also within rwanda and and the um, the one of the, some of the questions that we have discussed with your room and the team are in the rwandan context also those of how to engage the next generations uh, so they are a specific um a specific audience um for reasons similar to the ones that we saw in, in the second generation um, graphic novel that we briefly showed the communication between generations is not always the easiest there was also a political discourse about certain um genocides and mass atrocities that can in itself be a call for action um where, where, where in some in some contexts the discourses are more established and more consensual than in others so it's it's uh i don't think we have a question that maybe applies across all clusters, I would say, but I think it's very important to take contextualized approaches and 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 think and be aware of our different audiences and their perspectives and needs. And that's also why for us, it's very important that we have the random partners um, in the clusters and you obviously have, have you know, uh, your own partners within within your clusters um, to, to make sure that that it's, um, it's a, you know, community driven, um project as well that 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 um works works on different levels i'm not sure if i can add something to this question um um being not part of one of the clusters but i'm thinking about um the reception um of comics uh, at large that because we had this in our conversation that um but we didn't mention it clearly that um, in contrast to other uh, media, how you consume, how you read a comic is something that can be very intimate because there's intimacy created because you read it on your own. You're not sitting with other people uh, in a movie theater, for example. So this is one thing that we can think of uh, when we um, um, think of um, the audience and how comics are being um, read. Um, and I would also um, say that it's very um, with when I think of uh, the But I Live anthology, um, it's for one part an, a, a comic that can be used by teaching the Holocaust to students, to a younger audience, but also to uh, uh, older people. It um, has um, the uh, potential to reach a very broad audience. And this is something that other Holocaust comics like Mouse, for example, have already shown that you can um, um, decode it on different levels and you can use it um, for different uh, goals and audiences. And this is something that is, um, uh, has great potential. I think um, our next question really connects with that final point that you're making, Veronique, about the um, legibility of comics um, and how 
we so the question is to what extent is the assumption that everyone can read comics correct we are sufficiently aware that comics especially comics representing human rights atrocities have different meanings to different generations uh, and to potentially different readers in different cultures or countries and so what do we do about um, the legibility of the comics form and this is something that i encounter every time i teach comics because i know i can't assume that students are prepared to read comics uh, which seems at odds with how infused our popular culture is with the narratives of comics for example the marvel universe so what what do you do with this conundrum in your in your research and teaching around comics and how legible do you think the work that we do as comic scholars is to other readers of comics i get that all the time do you think anyone else sees what you see <laughs> and that doesn't interest me as much <laughs> I think it's important to say that uh, you have to learn how to read comics um, and how to decode uh, what you see. But this is something that applies to other media as well. So we are talking about uh, media expertise or uh, media competence. And this is, of course, something that we um, I had to learn it myself how to there's a specific language to talk about comics it's scholar it's, it's comic scholarship uh, so it's the same for how we analyze and talk about literature uh, when we have metaphors and I don't know what so we have panels and I don't know what <laughs> we are talking about comics so of course this is something that is part of what we are doing as uh, when we teach um uh, as uh, comic scholars. So this is the one thing. And then um, like with, I repeat myself, I know I'm sorry, but with other media as well, as uh, when we think of Stuart Hall and his coding and decoding and encoding uh, model, we can never be sure how something is received by the audience. It can be encoded in a specific way and uh, that might lead to a specific way to decode it, but we cannot guarantee it 100%, but to reflect upon uh, that there are different cultural backgrounds, that it might be traumatic to see specific uh, images remediated in different contexts. This is something, this is the work, um, and this is part of the project, as I understand it, to think about this whole process and all the pitfalls and all the um, also the the problems, the problematic aspects that come with representation in any kind when it comes to genocide, traumatic events, and so on. Yes, thank you for that question, Case. I think it's it's an important one, and one I think you know, and as Veronica said, it it takes you know a learning. Uh, curve and I, in response to your question, I would say I, I, I wouldn't take it for granted. Um, I think it's something that we have to indeed um, learn, and and that's true for the you know um, the 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 medium, uh, the tools of the medium that Veronique was mentioning. It's also equally true for the cultural side um, of things. It, it, there's a bit of a paradox because we think oh it's an it's an accessible language, it's a universal language, but then very soon you you run into culture specific things things as well and um I, I did a project uh, during covid read around political cartoons with young people and and a lot of the cultural references that we take for granted were not understood and political cartoons very much draw um on cultural references and on cultural understanding to make to make meaning and metaphors and so forth so it's not it's not it's not something i think we can take for granted and we have to be um very aware of that cultural specificity as well in terms of you know frameworks of production, also frameworks of reception um, on, on, on both sides. And, and it's, you know, we've touched upon it a few times that this is a very broad intercultural project and that that comes with, you know, interesting challenges that it's very um, something that, again, we have to be ethically um, ethically aware of and, and um, take into account both when we work with the survivors, but then also when we, when we engage um, with audiences. And the fact that the project does have an educational component to it is in a way that also the the role of the teacher, um, hopefully, to support to support that reading and 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 to um, help help students both with the text and with the context. And that's another aspect of collaborative work to combine expertise so that we can see and detect these different references that we might not know from our own cultural background, but that other people might know. And to combine this expertise, this is so important. 
Uh, thank you both. Uh, our last question um, is about the feedback and that you've received from survivors. And I know that Veronique, you're not working with any survivors. So I thought maybe Francisco, you could speak a little bit about um, the relationship building with survivors and the comments they've made about this process. And then Veronique, maybe you could talk a little bit about the reception of uh, the texts that you've worked with in Germany. Coming, They're coming out of a project that is grounded in Canada um, and the reception here is likely very different than the reception in Germany. And so since you've been working so intimately with some of the texts that are coming out of this project, I'd like to invite you to speak about that reception. But Francisca, um, how, what, what are the survivors saying? Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to maybe answer that question a little bit indirectly because obviously we were, um, there's been a first project and then now the second project. And in the first project, I did not work with the survivors directly myself, but we did meet them during the artist cafes that we held. And I think um, throughout the project, we felt it was very important that the artists remained involved and kept kept ownership. Um, and obviously, um, Charlotte and other persons involved in the project will be best placed to talk about that process. Um, so the, the the survivors um see drafts of the of the story are able to um comment on them um and and you know um discuss changes possible changes with the artists um so it's it's a um as as Bill was also saying a, a, a kind of co-creation in in that respect um so I think um all survivors have have been um very very happy in the process and of 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 or, you know right in the process of products I'm not quite sure where the position is but I think um I think the collaborations um in the first project have gone well but it's you know it's a collaboration and it's a trust process and so um I think it takes it takes time to build a relationship um and 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 that's also um a process that is you know that is ongoing ongoing in, in, in the Rwanda cluster at the moment and I'm I'm sure in in, in other clusters so it's very important to keep to keep that communication um, open, so it's it's not necessarily a question of feedback in that sense, but maybe more um, of of co creation and ongoing dialogue. I think I can speak a little bit to um, some of the reactions that we've had with our work with the survivors in the Turtle Island cluster. I'm a settler scholar, but I'm helping co lead and mostly facilitate conversations about the Canadian residential school system, and uh, there's been. Uh, the work that we're trying to do is really honoring storytelling. And I feel that our survivors feel that as well, honoring storytelling and honoring the gaps in memory as Veronique um, and the, and the problems of memory and the lived experience of, of surviving uh, one of these, uh, the experience of, of genocide or human rights uh, atrocities. And so this, um, honoring and sitting with story and being able to communicate that from an individual experience. We've received a lot of really positive feedback about it and in our engagements around story, uh, really profound stories that are being shared that are even off the record. And so just sitting and having these conversations, listening, um, trying to listen well, be a good listener, as opposed to dictate the outcomes of a research project, as we all too often do as researchers in higher education. So it's been a profoundly changing experience for me. And I hope that's the same with many of the cluster leads that are also part of this project. Uh, Veronique, do you want to speak a little bit about to the reception of um, But I Live and also the new volume by Barbara Yellen, if you have any uh, insider experience and in how it's being received in Germany? Um, it's not inside experience, but as, as far as I I uh, uh, perceive it myself, it's perceived very well in Germany. Um, at least it's very um, 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 there's um, positive a lot of positive feedback. Um, the few uh, events I attended or hosted uh, when uh, Barbara Yelling was reading from her book from her comic. Um, there were always a huge audience um, and people were very moved by the whole story and how it's been visualized and told in comics form. So um, I think um, this it works very well. And of course, in the light of current events from a German perspective, um, 
Amy Abel, Die Farbe der Erinnerung, The New Comic, as well as um, The Butter Live Anthology, um, is highly acclaimed at the moment and um, something that people want to read um, and uh, think that it's necessary that we have um, um, new forms of commemoration and um, that we keep uh, remembering. Um, and this is a specific, from a specific German standpoint, that it's always specific when it comes to anti-Semitism and uh, uh, the Holocaust. But um, this is uh, the perspective that I can, or the, the the feedback I perceive in my surrounding. And I think that might be the perfect note to end on. The answer why comics is to keep remembering. Uh, so I really thank you for that. That's um, We are at our time as well. So how perfect. Um, but over the course of this conversation, I help, I hope we illuminated for many of our participants why we've turned to comics, how we've turned to comics, and what comics bring to these discourses, in particular in relationship to memory um, and I, 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 we welcome further questions via email. Uh, we are sharing an email address in our chat. But in the meantime, we uh, will let you go to continue on your day. We honestly didn't think we'd take the full hour and a half, but here we are. You get three comic scholars in a virtual room and we can't shut up. <laughs> so thank you so much for attending today's event. I know that there is uh, information on the next part of the series uh, in the chat. And please visit the Public Humanities Hub website at UBC to learn more about the work that we're doing and um, as well as the project website. So thank you both again for joining me and us in this conversation. Uh, I look forward to continuing it in a different forum, maybe in person one of these days. Thank you so Thanks much. For thank you. Thank you very Take much. Care. Thank you. Both. Bye. Thanks for Bye. listening. <laughs> thank you.